Well, I think that uh, what inspired me was simply that uh, my parents had made such a point of telling me the whole story that it gradually dawned on me that it was important. And as I grew older and learned more and more about the Holocaust, I felt that it was absolutely necessary for people to understand what uh, my parents' generation and even I and my brother had gone through. And it also, there was some dimension about our experience that I felt was not very much reflected in, in much of what I read. Namely, the experience of ordinary people, uh, people who didn't suddenly become famous doctors, lawyers, artists, and poets in later life, but simply managed to survive. And I wanted to stress how just managing to survive, just struggling to be normal, was already a huge achievement. Uh, and that uh, my parents deserved as much praise for surviving and producing a family of people who did manage to do some things in life was just as important as those who went on to become really famous. You get contradictory lessons when you look at the Holocaust. And uh, some in some ways, you never re resolve the contradictions. You just realize that you're going to have to continue to struggle with them. Um, and perhaps that's true uh, in terms of all of us in our lives in general. The lessons that we learned were random chance is so important. Your luck is so important. Uh, and it's not something that you actually have control over. Why did uh, the Nazi officer shoot uh, the man next to my uncle for hiding something, but decide only to club my uncle uh, on the ear? It's just that difference which had to do with the, the random changing mood of this individual, and it didn't have anything to do with the people themselves. Uh, and, and, there, and this happens so often in these stories that it has to do more with random chance. At the same time, you also realize that the force of leadership and personality in struggling against evil is also crucial, despite the fact that random chance seems to be there constantly in the background, it's still important for you to try. It's still important for the individual to push for, for survival, for a better life, uh, because without that, nothing will happen, even, in the, even I when you're surrounded by random chance. Well, it's, um, it's a question I'm uh, struggling with myself today. Um, has the world really changed? In a way, um, in my life experience, the world was a became a better place somewhere around 1960. And that lasted for about 30, 40 years. Uh, but has since gone back to somewhere where I feel that evil has been allowed into the world again. Um, I got that sensation in terms of anti-Semitism around the time of the, um, the First World Conference on Racism, where the promotion of hatred against Jews became a part of fighting racism, which seems to be contradictory. And yet, that's what was happening at, at in Durban, in South Africa. Um, and it was something that I couldn't quite understand. How can one fight against racism 
and still be promoting hatred against Jews. Uh, and it's because those two things have become tied together in a way in the world that um, it's become it's become risky for everybody, not just for Jews, because what we, we saw what happened when anti-Semitism was allowed to grow to, uh, to an enormous extent before the Second World War. Basically, we had the Second World War, and it wasn't just Jews who died. It was millions and millions of other people. And I'm afraid, I have this fear because of who I am and where I come from, that it's possible that anti-Semitism will play that role again in the world today. Now, I would like to continue, if it's okay. And I, what I want to say is, it's not that Jews are the only objects of hatred in the world today. Uh, it's, we know that. We know that Jews are not the uh, only groups uh, who are oppressed or kept down or uh, face enormous barriers in participating in their societies. It's not that Jews are the ones who are necessarily being killed in great numbers today. Uh, we just have to look at Iraq. Uh, we just have to look at Syria. Who's being killed? You know, it's Arabs. It's Muslims by other Arabs and Muslims. But that doesn't mean that it's going to stay like that. Once evil and violence and hatred enter the world, once it's allowed, it's like a virus. It'll spread. There's no question in my mind. And that's why we have to constantly be on alert for it here in this country, where you think, well, if that could never be. But we have to understand that this is a thing that gets communicated right now through the World Wide Web, through the influence of hate sites and recruitment sites for extremism. It continues to be a danger even if it is centered somewhere else. I want to just preface this by saying that fitting in is a challenge for everybody. Uh, it doesn't matter how rich you are, what ethnicity you are, or what city you are born in. As a child, you have to learn to fit into your environment. And uh, that's a challenge for everybody. Because perhaps you have a personality that doesn't fit with whatever environment you happen to be born into. So there's that challenge. For immigrants, it's, uh, it's much greater because the, the fitting in is into a culture that's completely different from you. And you come as, quite often you come as an adult. And if you come as an adult, um, relearning everything uh, is practically impossible. And you have to find the things that you can relearn that allow you to function. And even in some cases to become highly successful. If you come here as a child, well, then it's a little different. You have, you have the capacity to start to, to learn like the other children that you're with. Uh, even there, it's not always true. It's not true in every case. And finally, there's the fact that you as a child are learning in an environment where you pick things up so quickly from your, you from your friends. Uh, from television, from what, uh, from the internet, from what's all around you, uh, whereas your parents uh, are still uh, shaped to a large extent by what they learned where they came from. So there, you end up always with a kind of intergenerational struggle between parents who have learned one thing and children who've learned a lot another, and you have a parents having a difficult time controlling their children, getting respect from their children um, because they speak with funny accents, they have funny ideas, they, have, they say things that don't fit in. And, uh, and that's, what w that's the strange thing about fitting in. Uh, 
it, everyone has to do it, but it isn't always a, uh, a, good, a good thing. Sometimes it has a negative implication. I grew up at a time when one, I tried to hide who I was. Uh, I found it dangerous to fully expose who I was. Uh, when I was uh, five or six years old, my brother came up to me and told me he was going to change my name because my name was too Jewish. And uh, he changed my name from Reuben to Norm. And I was basically called Norm in my environment for the next 10 years um, just because we were fearful of openly saying who we were. Now that changed somewhere in the 1960s. It became possible for people to openly express who they were and that's more or less what we have in the world today. So the whole balance between integrating and fitting in, fitting in and uh, maintaining who you are is, has changed. And there are enormous challenges with that change in balance. When I was young, the emphasis was on keeping who you were really at home. You could go to, uh, I could go to Jewish school, my friends could go to Chinese school, my other friend went to Ukrainian school. You, but you didn't bring that together into the common space except sort of uh, uh, to, to satisfy the interest of somebody who was curious. But otherwise, you didn't really bring that out all the time. You didn't trot out your baggage. Uh, nowadays, it seems to me that we're much more open about that. And that's both a good thing, and also it is a worrisome thing to the extent that it's going to cause more clashes. And one of the things I have learned is that compromise is essential to building a society where everyone can participate together. It's not always possible to, to get your way, uh, that is your way in your home culture, because you're living with people who come from many different cultures. Uh, you know, as I said, it took me a long time to realize that uh, other people were facing discrimination barriers in the way that I was. Other people felt the same way I did, that they couldn't fully express who they were. Uh, it took me a long time to realize that the, the Chinese in my neighborhood were people who were descended from uh, individuals who had come to Canada in the late 1800s. They weren't recent immigrants, just because they looked a little different. Uh, the Japanese were descended from immigrants to British Columbia, uh, again, at the end of the 1800s and the early 1900s. Just because they looked a little different didn't mean they were immigrants. And so our experience wasn't the same. They didn't come to the country as immigrants. They were born here. Uh, and so the discrimination they faced was in a way more painful because they didn't have to learn how to be Canadian, they were Canadian, and yet they were discriminated against anyway. And for me, I felt I had to learn how to be Canadian. I had to learn how to fit in. Um, and that, of course, was a difficult process. But they already mastered many aspects of being Canadian, and it didn't matter. <laughs> there were still barriers to their fitting in. Multiculturalism for me was, first of all, the open recognition that um, s certain kinds of differences are validly human. That just because someone comes from a Ukrainian background and has uh, loves Ukrainian dance and speaks Ukrainian, is no re there's no reason to exclude them simply on the basis of their origin, that because someone is Jewish or Muslim or any other religion, Buddhist, Hindu, uh, 
it's not a r reason per se to exclude people. On the other hand, I've also learned this other aspect of the necessity of compromise, that you can't live together in a common society unless you have a common set of rules, a common framework that everybody is held accountable to. Uh, we, in order for that, we, in order for the country to work, for a society to work, is that we all have to buy into something that is going, that we can all be judged by, uh, so that we 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 we're not speaking uh, uh, at at uh, uh, from different points of view and therefore never being able to understand each other. If you're speaking from this point of view and I'm speaking from that point of view and I'm using you're using these standards and I'm using those, well then how would we uh, ever come to a common understanding? And part of that challenge is looking at the history of Canada. And certainly for Aboriginals, for Quebecois, for people who have been in the country for a long time, uh, that's one of the biggest challenges because our history has been written in a certain way by certain forces uh, dominant in our society. How we come to grips with that past in a way that brings us close together is of course, as you know, one of the challenges that we face today, that some people who have been written out of history have now got to be written back into it, and they have to be written back into it in a way that's communicated to all of us, and that we all have to accept. And I'm a great believer in understanding the history of your country. If you're going to become Canadian, you have to understand that Canadians once took Japanese Canadians and put them in internment camps. That has to become part of your own psyche. It has to become part of what you understand about yourself. Uh, you have to understand not only the glorious, wonderful things that are in Canada, but you also have to understand what its drawbacks have been. And you have to come to terms with it. You have to bring them together inside yourself if you are ever to become fully Canadian. And that applies to everybody, including the minorities who have suffered those, uh, those, uh, those terrible uh, actions. They have to come to terms with it, too. You have to understand that racism is not a single thing in Canada. It's a multifaceted thing which varies from one part of the country to the other because the population living in each part of the country is different. And it's one of the things that is most challenging about Canada and one of the things that still, we, we st it's still an obstacle to us in terms of promoting that common framework. Uh, how do I promote a common framework that, that will be acceptable both in British Columbia and uh, Newfoundland? What is it that that's going to join these diverse con um, areas together. And in terms of what we teach, um, it's it, it, you have to understand that each province is responsible for its own education system. Well, how do, how do we create a federal or national perspective on the basis of such individualized curricula so that what happens in one part of the country uh, has no necessary connection with other parts of, of, the, of the country. Just take a look at the difference between what you learn about history in Quebec and what you learn about history in Nova Scotia. It's, they're not the same histories. Uh, and uh, how do you bring those two closer together? How do we uh, get that Canadian understanding to filter into everybody. That's the biggest challenge for me. And whatever the Canadian Race Relations Foundation can do to play a role in that, I think is really crucial. It's funny thing. When I was younger, I would have said the fight for human rights and equality. And while I still think those things are important, I've come to appreciate more and more the idea of 
commitment to a national perspective, commitment to Canada as being very important. We have, we've left it aside. It's been left out of the picture in many, many curricula uh, across the country. And I think the balance has to be redressed. We need to put more of that in. Uh, it's not that the other things are not important. Of course they are. Uh, they're fundamental. But leaving out that total commitment to, a, to Canada and to what it stands for and to what a national framework or national set of standards and perspectives uh, are, if we leave that out, then I think we will never succeed in eliminating racism in this country. This is a tough one. What is the primary responsibility? Is it to be true to yourself? Is it to, I think the primary responsibility is to learn what the national perspective is, to learn the history of this country and how that national perspective grew out of where we have been as a country, uh, and to understand uh, the full diversity of where people come from uh, around the world to Canada and where people come from in Canada, what their history has been. That's the important thing is to learn, to educate yourself, to understand others. That's your prime responsibility as a citizen uh, because you have, and the other, th the other responsibility is to participate in our society, to take part in it. And it and it's in order to take part in it that you have to understand where you are and where, how others fit into your life uh, a in a way that uh, you can live together and that you can uh, be produce a more, a more beneficial future for everyone and for all their descendants. <laughs>